This video is sponsored by Cord Company, manufacturers of the speaker cables and interconnects used by a British audiophile. For more information about these and their other products, please click the link in the description. I thought I'd give you a little bit of a different perspective today, so I'm here sat in the corner of my listening room. Anyway, there's plenty to get through, so let me get straight to the business at hand. Judging by the demographics of my channel, there's a few of you out there that will remember the introduction of the original Quad 33 preamp and 303 power amp. For the rest of us, well, we just have to imagine what the world of hi-fi was like back in the late 60s. In the previous decade, mono listening was the norm, even though stereo recordings had been around for a while, 1967 could still be considered the early days of two-channel listening, some 15 years before the birth of CD, where vinyl and valve amplifiers ruled the roost. Transistor amplifiers were in existence, but they were normally receivers, pre, power and radio in one box, maligned by many audiophiles of the age for having a hard and brittle sound. By 1967, Peter Walker had established Quad over 20 years as one of the world's leading and most innovative hi-fi companies. Their valve amplifiers were being used in many studios, including the BBC, and their ESL speakers, the world's first full-range electrostatic speakers. Well, that's the stuff of legend, and a version of those is still being produced today. But Peter Walker was just about to launch another landmark product. Their first transistor-based amplifiers, Innovative enough to win the prestigious Council of Industrial Design Award in 1969 and a place in the New York Museum of Modern Art. The 33 preamp and the 303 power amp were the most commercially successful amplifiers that Quad ever produced, with over 120,000 preamps sold and almost 100,000 power amps. Okay, this has turned into a bit of a history lesson. I apologize, but I do love all of this stuff. Let me move on with every manufacturer that's even got a little bit of pedigree reviving their back catalogue. It was only a matter of time before IAG that owned Quad dusted the file on the iconic 33 303s. So let's see what the new ones have to offer. One glance at the new 33 preamp and it's unmistakable that the industrial design leans heavily on the original yet it still feels modern thanks to a matte silver finish and a chassis formed from substantial gauge aluminium plate work. The 33 preamp retails for £1,199 in the UK. Proportions are also carried over from the 1967 Classic, a half rack width unit measuring 258 by 83 by 165 millimetres or 10.2 by 3.3 by 6.5 inches. The weight is 4 kilograms, that's 8.8 pounds. The four buttons underneath the display have been reassigned for the modern era. Originally they were there to engage filters, rolling off at 5, 7 and 10 kilohertz, provided to compensate for high frequency noise on many vinyl recordings back in the day. They now power up the 33, back like the 1980s style dot matrix display, engage the tone controls and select between the built-in moving magnet and moving coil phono stage. It's a nice touch that the three flush mount rotary dials have been retained above the display. This was a striking feature of the original. They provide left-right channel balance, bass attenuation or augmentation by up to 3 dB and a tilt in the frequency response centered around 700 Hz axes. Dropping the bass lifts the treble and vice versa in 1 dB steps. Walker felt that tilt provided a more subtle adjustment to the sound than traditional tone controls. On the other side of the 6.35 mm quarter inch headphone jack and IR sensor are four buttons for input selection. To stay faithful to the original, the 33 remains an all analog affair. No digital inputs are provided. The large rotary dial adjusts volume via a good quality motorized Alps potentiometer. The supplied remote control is plastic, but of decent size and offers comprehensive functionality. The 1960s DIN connectors have been replaced with RCA and XLR. There's a balanced XLR analog output, a set of single-ended RCA pre-outs, and a fixed-level auxiliary output should you wish to bypass the volume control. 12-volt trigger connections are provided for system integration, and the USB port is only for accepting firmware updates. There's one XLR balanced input and four single-ended RCA inputs. The one marked Phono is for turntables. 
the new 303 power amp also aesthetically borrows substantially from the original a narrow deep upright demeanor with distinctive heat sinks running down the front it sits stout and proud like a great 1930s art deco building battersea power station eat your heart out my only gripe is the power button the unit automatically goes into standby after a while if no signal is detected even when dormant a little light bleeds through so when you return to play something and no sound comes out it's not immediately obvious that the 303 isn't on to the business end and the speaker binding posts are of reasonable quality the balanced xlr and single-ended rca analog outputs are switchable but the 303 can also run in bridge mono mode as a mono amplifier which means that you'll need to add another one for two-channel listening this substantially increases power from 50 to 140 watts per channel into an 8 ohm load. The team responsible for the new 33303s is Jan Etner. He's the lead electronics designer for the IG portfolio products. And for this particular project, he worked very closely alongside Quad's two most experienced service engineers. Now, let me get these names right there. Paul McConville and Rob Flain, as well as David McNeil, who's the chief of industrial design at Quad and has been there for around 20 years. Now they came up with a completely new circuit design for the 33 and I did question Jan about this, who explained that even though the 33 was a great preamplifier in its day, he felt that the game had moved on in terms of modern circuits and modern components. And he tried to hold in his mind the kind of circuit that Peter Walker would have come up with if he was producing the 33 today. Let me show you the internals of the 33 preamplifier, starting with the power supply. And we have a Norotel toroidal transformer of decent size. Norotel is a good quality brand, so that's not a cheap part. And toroids emit less noise than the EI type. Having decent sized transformers helps to keep power supply impedance low. And there are plenty of filter capacitance for a preamplifier, six caps there three slightly smaller ones, three larger ones. They're from Chinese manufacturer Decon. Ideally, I'd like to see a higher tier capacitors than those, but I suppose it's understandable. That's the Alps potentiometer, volume control, good quality part. In order for this amplifier to fit into this chassis, they've got boards on two levels. And I think this board here in the corner has the phono stage because the phono terminals are on the other side so it makes sense to have it there and a small power supply which may well be for this unit when it's in standby the main preamplifier board runs on the bottom where you'll have input switching system control and the preamplifier section itself lots of surface mount components and ICs all what you'd expect to see on a preamplifier around this price as for the 303 power amplifier, well in one way it can be considered an evolutionary rather than revolutionary update to the original and that's because it retains one key element that makes a 303 amplifier a 303 amplifier, the triples output stage. So let me explain how that works. Early transistor amplifiers were plagued with thermal instability problems and the quiescent current drifting. That's the current passing through the transistor under no load. There was also a reliance on asymmetrical circuit topologies at the time. Both contributed to high distortion. Peter Walker's symmetrical triples output stage solved these problems by combining three directly coupled transistors operating respectively at low, medium and high power. By comparing the quiescent current to a fixed voltage in stages 1 and 2, due to the low power, negligible changes in temperature occurred. This led Quad to claim that the 303 was the world's first low distortion transistor amplifier. It certainly is a landmark product in the history of amplifier design. Here's the internals of the 303 power amplifier. Let's start with the power supply again. Another Norotel toroidal transformer rated at 200 VA, which is ample for an amplifier that produces 50 watts per channel into 8 ohms. Okay, it goes up to 140 watts when in bridge mono configuration. There's the power supply board with four filter caps on there, large filter caps, each rated at 15,000 microfarads. IG tend to be generous with their filter caps. That helps to provide a stable voltage for the circuitry, filter out noise, and provide an injection of current normally when you need it for base transients. 
They're on a cap, so very good quality, so very happy with what's there. There's a little board here, which I presume is the balance circuitry, because the XLR terminals mount to it. And the power amplifier modules are here. Now hopefully you can make out the triples output stage. These three heat sinks, the transistors will be mounted to it. And you can't quite see it so clearly, but it'd be exactly the same for the other channel on the other side. So overall, very happy with what's on offer here for the £1,200 asking price. The old Quad 33 303s were prized for a silky smooth sound, good detail and decent driving ability. I'm sure that's what the new Quad team were briefed to come up with and that's exactly what they've delivered. They certainly sound nothing like the Audiolab 7000A that I reviewed a while back, which is also a Jan Ertner design. The 7000A is a mighty fine amplifier for £1,100 with a great built-in DAC, but adjectives like dry and analytical describe the sound. The 33303s have sonically much more in common with another amplifier, revived and updated from decades past. The fabulous £1,499 Musical Fidelity A1 with its conservatively rated 25 watts of Class A power. These quads remind me a lot of the Musical Fidelity A1. The bass is full and juicy, not the best note to note definition, but it isn't bad. More comfortable with soft rock than hard rock, more eagles than Metallica, but there's reasonable current capability, or at least there seems to be because bass lines are kept in check even when things get motoring. The vintage sonic vibe continues into the mid-range. IAG certainly know how to make crisp sounding amplifiers, but this ain't it. Transients have been softened and there's a realistic mass to vocals and instruments. I suspect this is the signature sound of the original 303, which was largely credited to the triples output stage. It's not a sound that's gonna to appeal to everyone or work with all types of speakers, I'll cover specific pairings in the next section, but if you're after a sound that's non-fatiguing, rich and enveloping, and invokes nostalgic feelings of the past, well, the Quad 33 303s will be your bag. With the right speakers, the Quad Duo will deliver a wide soundstage, extending laterally way beyond the speakers. There's also acceptable soundstage depth and localization of performers but the very finest integrated amplifiers that I've heard for circa £2,000 offer better stereo imaging and performance in certain areas. My Wilsonton R8 with Tungsol 6SL7s on the pre, PS Vane T2 collection CV181 tubes on the driving stage, and KT88s from the same collection on the output stage does what valve amplifiers are coveted for. It throws out a huge soundstage with punchy bass, and a full sounding mid-range. It's not the last word in control, but a lot of fun. The two amplifiers also deliver similar levels of resolution. The R8 is a little bit spicier in the upper mid-range and area on top, whereas the Quad Duo still delivers good high frequency detail, but pulls things back a little bit for a more relaxed presentation. My Exposure 2510 is a little lighter on its feet. The extra agility in the bass, clarity in the mid-range and openness on top allows it to reveal more of the recordings when it comes to unearthing timbre and fine tones. Adding a second 303 and running the power amps in bridge mono mode takes scale, dynamics and instrument separation beyond what my exposure integrated can deliver, even if the ability to render subtle details still remains a touch behind. One 33 and two 303s, and you've got levels of grip and control approaching my Hegel H190 the Hegel is still the more resolving and neutral amplifier, but I can see some people preferring the richer and more fluid presentation of the quads, and I certainly did with some speakers. The Quad 33 preamp and 303 power amp are pretty much plug and play devices. A nice printed manual is provided, but I don't see too many people needing to use it. Just make sure you use the right speaker terminals if you're running two 303s in bridge mono mode. Connect across the two red terminals in the correct polarity, which is clearly labeled. I make no secret of the fact that I'm not generally a fan of tone controls, 
But the ones on the 33 preamp, well, they're not quite conventional. With certain speakers, I found it useful to pull the bass down by one or two dB to achieve a better tonal balance. For a change, this was achieved without any loss in fidelity. Sadly, I couldn't say the same for the tilt control. Adjustments in the mids and highs are usually more problematic, and that was the case here. The reduction in clarity in soundstage was too apparent. Sorry, Peter Walker. I'm sure it's still much better than a straightforward treble adjustment. Anyway, onto speaker pairings. It might be useful to divide my speakers into two categories, the lambs and the pigs. The easy to drive speakers, those are the lambs by the way. Well, the 33 with just one 303 did great. The monitor audio silver 100 should not be overlooked as a suitable partner, despite their 799 pound asking price. These wonderfully resolving speakers normally have a cool tone, which was completely eradicated by the 33-303 combo. The sound was just a touch on the warm side, which is my preference. Normally the characteristics of the speaker are more prominent than the characteristics of the amplifier. That's the case with my exposure and Hegel, but not the quads. The sound here was beautifully balanced. The 1500 pound Amphion Argon ones are a touch more detailed, refined, and turn up the tonal temperature just a couple of degrees higher than the Silver 100s. They also combine superbly well with the Quad Duo. Switching back in, my Exposure 2510 was a bit of a mixed bag. I preferred the resolution and the finesse of the 2510, but a better tonal balance was achieved by the 33 303s. The 1500 pound Dali Minuet SEs are more of a truth teller to what's upstream than the Silver 100s and the Argon 1s. Here the superior fidelity of the 2510 made it the winner, but those seeking a warmer sound should opt for the quads. Enough about the lambs. Now for the pigs. My vintage Pratt Response 1 SCs sounded small and muddy with the 33303. This can often be the case as they respond well to amplifiers that have more drive. Thankfully, adding another 303 considerably opened up the soundstage and improved instrument separation. It was a similar case with Quad's own 1800 pound Ravella 1s, speakers that don't sound great until they're driven properly. Running two 303s made a massive difference to the control exerted over the midwoofers, cleaning up the bass and bleed through to the midrange. The 33 303s running in bridge mono configuration don't have quite enough detail to be my preferred solution for my Proax and the Quadravella 1s, but 1303 is going to be ample to drive many speakers that I can think of below £2,000. It did great with the Monitor Audio Silver 100s, my Amphion Argon 1s and the Dali Minuet SEs. Adding a second one noticeably improves grip and control, allows you to play louder and drive trickier speakers. I would suggest sticking to speakers on the cool to neutral side though. The Quad 33303s are as, as striking a design today as they were back in 1967. The IAG design team had the unenviable task of bringing them up to date, whilst retaining the spirit of the original and more importantly, the characteristic sound. They've done an admirable job. The 33 is a modern preamp that tips its hat gracefully to the past. The 303 power amp retains the triple's output stage and the sound signature of its predecessor. They combine to provide a warm, rich sound with good resolution and decent driving capability. They're not the last word in picking out every detail and neutrality, nor were they intended to be. There's a vintage vibe about the looks and a nostalgic vibe about the sound, and some care needs to be taken with partnering speakers for them to sound their best. Hopefully I've covered that all fairly comprehensively in this review. I'm very fond of the 33 303s and I'm sure many others will be. And that's why the Quad 33 preamp and 303 power amp get a highly recommended from this channel. My question for today is, are there any classic designs from the past that you would like to see come back and why? Please let me know about that in the comments section. I'm sure you know what to do by now if you want to support me here and what I do. Like, share, subscribe, hit the bell notification. Check me out on Patreon, there's a couple of tiers you can access there if you think I can help you on your audiophile journey. Also check out the ABA Club on Patreon which has some great ways to interact with me and fellow Patreons. But for today, for now, I'm British Audiophile, signing off.